Peroxide, and what it does is peroxisomes help to digest lipids, but in the process they produce peroxides, and peroxides are a toxin. They also contain enzymes to get rid of the toxin. So there are um, there are actually three oxygen-related molecules that are really bad for that matter. One is let me think it's H two O two. That's a peroxide. The other one are superoxides, and the other one is hydroxy radical. All three of those are what, are what are called the oxidant molecules. They will cause other molecules to react, and if you cause other molecules to react, they will change. What happens if it's DNA? Right? What happens if it's a protein that you want its function and they change them? So those are the three, three poisons. These are peroxides, superoxides, and hydroxy radicals. This, my friends, is a bull in a china shop. We do not have an enzyme that, not, that breaks that down. The only good point is its first reaction usually converts it to superoxides, and we have an enzyme called superoxide dismutase that breaks it down. We also have peroxidase molecules that break those down. Imagine if we didn't have those enzymes. We would be constantly bombarded because we live in an oxygen environment. We'd be constantly bombarded by these toxins. The oxygen environment would literally be poisonous to us. In fact, there are some bacteria, the true anaerobes, the ones that like live in your colon, that can't be exposed to any oxygen at all. They would die because they can't get rid of these, these radicals. So, when you, when you work with them, it's actually pretty cool. When you work with them, you have to work in a fume hose that's sealed. You know, fume hose like that in chemistry, except they're completely sealed and filled with nitrogen. And you work with gloves that reach inside because if any oxygen got in there, it would literally kill these bacteria. So there's some pretty cool stuff. Um, but anyway, yeah, we have, we have enzymes for these two, and this one becomes that one, so it doesn't do as much damage as it could. Anyway. So that's, that's related to the peroxisomes, okay? Ah. Any questions before we begin? Just a reminder, lab, lab, let, the exam is Friday. Friday, right. We should have a little bit of relief time on Wednesday, a little. So be prepared, bring some questions with you. Because um, if we do have time, the last thing I want to do is, anyone got any questions? Any of your crickets? So, yes? Do you have a review guide posted? There should be one online. Um, it would be in chapters six and seven. Okay. It's, it's like right at the bottom of the, of the um, content page okay. for this unit, yeah. At some point, at some point further along, we'll go over replication. That would be unit uh, four. The third unit after this one, we do metabolism. So we do energy enzymes, glycolysis, Krebs cycle, citric acid, Krebs cycle, electron transport, and photosynthesis. That's unit three. Unit four is cell division, cell cycle. Oh, no, no, that's genetics. It's uh, cell cycle and genetics, molecular and um, um, chromosomal. And then the fifth unit is gene expression, 
and gene technology, DNA technology and evolution. So, but we will come back and when we first start on DNA, we'll talk about the molecular structure of them. So we, because it, it's based on the molecular structure. Any questions so far? All right, so just bring a couple questions with you for, for Wednesday, just in case we do have time, because um, if I don't know what you have questions about, it's hard for me to actually, I have to start at the beginning and then it's not very efficient. All right, so. Last time we wrapped up cell membrane and we started in on transport, didn't we? Yeah. And we got to approximately this point right here, correct? No, we got to, where'd we get to? That one. Well, okay, I read that one. That one. Okay. All right. Now, I split the next slide into two. So I didn't really add anything extra. I just divided it up so it wouldn't be so loud. So the point is, we now know what can go in and what can go out, right? At least what can go directly through the membrane. Does that mean that those are completely excluded? No. no, it's not. It just means we have to find a different way. Right? We have to find a different way to get in. And that's what we're going to talk about next. And if we go back and look, diffusion, osmosis, those are going to be going right through the membrane. Facilitated diffusion is going to need something to help it, even though it doesn't require energy. These are much more complex. All right? Now, in addition, there's some uh, active transport through transport proteins as well. So anyway. I've talked about transport proteins before. All these are, are a transmembrane protein, okay? With a transmembrane protein, you just gotta remember, with a transmembrane protein, you remember, part of it is exposed outside, part of it is exposed inside. But in these cases, they, are, they have some form of space running through them. And because they are chemically different than the surrounding membrane, molecules can pass through them that wouldn't normally be able to pass through the membrane itself. All right? <clears throat> now, some of them can be passive, meaning they are just like an open window. When you open a window, air flows in and out passively. Okay? On the other hand, you can do it actively, in which case they require energy. And there's an there's a important reason why you might want to do that. Um, for instance, like with an air conditioner, if we just had our windows open, all the cold air would be flying out. But with an air conditioner, we concentrate the cold air inside the room, right? So sometimes they require energy, sometimes they don't. And I moved this, when you have this slide a little further down, I just duplicated it and moved it up so we can see. A channel protein, and I'm going to talk about these coming up here in a second. A channel protein is like an open window. Molecules can pass through based solely on concentration gradient. The molecule, the, the protein itself is not moving them. It's just an open window. However, think back to cartoons, right? The keyhole. Right? And the, every, every key would fit into it, right? No matter, they'd always find the key and find the one, perfect key, right? In today's world, our keys are much different, aren't they? The pattern of the structure of our keys are very, very complex. But this particular key fits into a particular lock, and then these teeth are able to open the lock and so on. So these proteins are just like that. Their tunnel is perfectly designed, perfectly shaped for a specific molecule. So if this happens to be a molecule called an aquaporin, an aquaporin, you can kind of guess what it does, right? Yeah, aquaporins allow molecules of water to pass. So the difference between a channel protein and a carrier protein is a channel protein is just that, it forms a channel that's always open. We sometimes refer to these as leak channels because molecules will constantly leak across the membrane if these are available. On the other hand, a carrier protein changes shape. 
So a carrier protein would be sort of like, it has to, it's not actually gonna spin around like this, but it kind of like opens and then closes, and then opens and closes. And you know, there it's in, now it just went through. Then it opens up again, takes another one, it has to change shape. All right, yes? So the channel protein's got no gate. Right, it's, just in and it's out. always open, correct. The second one changes shape in order to get the molecule across. Now later on, we're gonna talk about a type of active transport that does this, only you can actually begin to concentrate molecules because if you spend energy, you can actually move it against its concentration gradient. You can push, a, push something uphill so to speak, okay? All right, now, as I said, channel proteins are, they, they're like a tunnel. Carrier proteins will bind a molecule and pull it through by the change of its shape. But aquaporins are very interesting because they're, remember, does a molecule, should a molecule of water be able to pass across a membrane? Why not? Water molecules are polar. The membrane itself would be, the middle of it would be hydrophobic. It would be nonpolar. So anything that's polar shouldn't be able to get across that middle part of the membrane. But when we talk about water, we talk as if it is able to just pass right through. It's almost to the point where we get so comfortable we forget that there's aquaporins there. Aquaporins are simply a channel protein that allows water to pass. So in fact, because they're passive and because they're always open, the only thing that affects its rate is how many aquaporins are there and what concentration of other solutes are present. So we don't even, we, you almost forget and you start talking like, like water is diffusing across, but in fact it's really not, okay? So an aquaporin is simply a channel protein that carries water. If you take a look at that, it can carry up to three billion molecules of water per second. That's why there's so many molecules moving around, we actually forget that they can't diffuse across. Okay? So, how many of you remember diffusion from chemistry? If there, as I said this before, if there's one, uh, two ideas out of say, you know, if there's five things that you could learn that would be this diffusion and osmosis would probably be in the top five. Now it doesn't seem like a big deal, but diffusion and osmosis have such a significant impact on living things that I would call it life or death and not exaggerate in one bit. Um, muscle contraction is due to concentration gradients of sodium and, and, and uh, potassium. Um, nerves fire due to concentration gradients. ATP is built by proton gradients. Um, calcium allows for excretion of neurotransmitters by nerves formed by a gradient. I mean, how do we get rid of hmm? capillary uh, ox oxygenation? Loss of oxygen, there, yeah, loss of oxygen and gaining of CO2 is all because of diffusion. Okay? Um, so, it's such an important concept, and it's such an easy concept to understand because this is one of those things that we can always fall back on and go, oh, I totally get it. If I had perfume, and I stood in the corner over here, or if I had a skunk, and I gave that skunk a good squeeze, you wouldn't be my friends for very long, but it wouldn't take long before the people on the other side knew I had my pet skunk here, right? Long story short, my father-in-law once was trapping woodchucks, happened to catch one that was black and white with a stripe down its back. How do you get a live skunk out of a live trap that's only this big? <laughs> it was very funny. But anyway, diffusion, molecules spread out. That's what it means, molecules disperse. How do we know where they go? We find out where they're in higher concentration and they move away from there. So if I had a big box of What's the cookie company? Mrs. Fields cookies, and I opened them up, and they were nice and fresh and warm. It wouldn't take long before every one of you would smell them, right? Have you ever lived in an apartment and happened to burn something on your stove? It's not long before everybody in your building is going, oh man, what was that? 
I lived in an apartment at Eightplex in college, and we knew when the people upstairs were cooking because you could smell it. That's dispersal of molecules. It just so happens that we can smell them. It happens in liquids, it happens in gases, it happens in solids, it's just much slower. Okay? And what is equilibrium? Equilibrium is not when diffusion stops. However, equilibrium simply means that you reach a balance point so that the movement of molecules in this direction is equal to the molecules moving in this direction. So if I told everyone to stand up and just start moving around, some of you might sit still. Others, you'd always look around and see where nobody was, right? It's kind of like a party. If you're not talking about food here, right, you move somewhere where nobody else is. Or better yet, you go to the theater, right? You're going to go watch a movie. You look at the, the audience. Does everyone just like accumulate right in the middle? No. There's like equal space among everybody. You want to sit as far away from everybody else as possible, don't you? That's sort of like diffusion, right? If you're told to all, you know, like start at the bottom and let, go find your spot, you'd all spread out. That's diffusion. All right. So equilibrium simply means that diffusion in all directions is equal. Keep that in mind. It doesn't stop. Okay. So, second of all, diffusion is based on concentrations, right? If there's more over here and less over there, it will move from here to there, right? If I burn some incense right here, the concentration of small, the, the, the order molecules will be here, and it won't be long until they spread throughout the room. So, we use a metaphor, like a slope. So, if there's more molecules over here, and less over here, it's a slope. Okay? How do things move? They move down a slope, right? So we call it a concentration gradient. So again, high over here, low over here, and it's going to move in this direction. It's going to move until that slope reaches equilibrium. And then movement in either way will be identical. So we say that every individual molecule moves down its own concentration gradient. And in fact, if I had chocolate chip cookie over in this corner and rotten egg over in that corner, they would diffuse in opposite directions based on their own concentrations. If they had the same concentrations, they would move at the same rate. All right? They would independently diffuse. Okay. So, if you know what concentration you start with, you can tell which direction they're going to move. So, for instance, in this case, if you start with molecules on this side and this is permeable, they will simply diffuse until the movement to the left and movement to the right is equal. All right? Now, same thing here. If you start with two different molecules, they will move independently until they are both balanced. Okay? I used to do this with a, with a molecule called sodium or potassium permanganate. Now, the molecule itself isn't that significant, except that when you put it in water, it turns Viking purple. So you put one little crystal in there, and you can watch this purple color spread out through the, through the beaker. It's pretty neat. But anyway, that's diffusion. Now, the one thing that we have to assume here is that there's nothing in the way, right? Because you can only move as far as the structures allow you to. So that's why I said, in this case, we're talking about a completely permeable barrier. With osmosis, now there's a problem. Osmosis occurs, with osmosis, you must have a semi-permeable membrane. Now, osmosis, by definition, is right there. Diffusion of water across a semi-permeable membrane. That is the purest definition. However, just like in many circumstances, the best definition may not be the simplest because we want, we want to simplify it. What does that mean? It means that water diffuses. It moves from, just like anything else, it moves from where it is in high concentration to where it is in low concentration. Now, on, on paper, that sounds legit, right? That sounds like anything else. But when do we have different concentrations of water? Exactly, when we're looking at the other dissolved material. So, let 
let's say we have a membrane. And that membrane is only partially soluble, which or partially um, permeable, it's semi-permeable. But it is not permeable to molecule X. Very cryptic. X cannot pass through the membrane. All right, so if we start with water on both sides, which side has a higher concentration of water? The left side or the right side? The right side. The right side. Why? Because some of that space is taken up by solute on the, or solvent, solute on the left. So which way would water move? Would it move to the left or to the right? It would move, it would diffuse to the Another simple way to put this, and this is probably one that probably hits a little closer to home, water wants to dilute. Water will move to where it needs to dilute whatever's there. So in this case, the molecules are on the left side, so the molecules on the right side will move toward it in order to dilute it. Okay? So, in that situation, what will happen is this will continue until the concentration of X over there and the X over here is the same. So if you can't get rid of the X, you have to make the volume bigger. All right. So if we take a look at this is a very simple, um, yes? Is osmosis always only water? Absolutely. Yep. So it's, it's the diffuse. That's why it's not anything different except it's diffusion of water with one stipulation across a semi-permeable membrane. Because that permeable membrane keeps X from diffusing. If X can't diffuse, water has to do it for them. All right? So if, water, if the molecule can't reduce its concentration like this, take a look at it. This is actually kind of this is a neat demonstration. If you start with the same amount of solution on both sides, however, this side contains a higher concentration of sugar. This one contains lower, but the membrane is such that the sugar can't cross. In that situation, water will dilute until the concentration is the same. And you can actually see later on, the left side will lose fluid, the right side will gain. And this, is, this can actually be observed. We will actually even measure the force of the osmosis. All you have to do is put a little pressure meter on there, and because the space above this keeps getting smaller. There's going to be a, a force moving in up that word. You can actually measure it. Pretty cool. <clears throat> so, in that case, all that's happening is water is diffusing across that barrier. Since the sugar can't, the water will do it for it. Okay? So far, so good. Now, one thing I want to point out. There, there are going to be some terms associated with osmosis. Not with diffusion, but osmosis. Don't try to memorize their details. If you can simply know what the definition means, the details falls into place. So, what do I mean by that? The terms are isotonic, hypertonic, and hypotonic. The prefix ISO, what does the prefix ISO mean? It means the same. Okay, ISO. Like, um, you can do isometric exercises where you push against a solid object. True story, they actually work to a point. But, ISO means the same. Isotherm, same temperature. Isobars, same uh, barometric pressure, right? Isosceles. Isosceles, same side on a triangle. Isolated means you're alone. Um, but anyway, ISO means the same. So in this case, Tonic is referring to the amount of cotton dissolved material. So if two solutions are isotonic, they have the same amount of dissolved material. Now, one thing I do want to point out. These terms are all relative. What do I mean by that? What does the term, it's all relative. When you compare one another. You're, yes, you are comparing not the absolute numbers, but you're comparing one to another. For instance, I'm six foot one inch tall. Am I tall compared to you? Actually, I'm not that much taller, right? I'm a, you know. <laughs> However, what if I went to Canterbury Downs and hung out with the jockeys? I'd be a giant compared to them. 
What if I went down to t Target Center and hung out with the Timberwolves? I'd be staring everybody in the chin, because down there I would be short. So even though my height didn't change, my relative height did change, right? So you're always talking in terms of relativity. What is next to? What are you comparing it to? So isotonic simply means you have the same concentration as something else. Now, when you have the same concentration as something else, what's the result? Equilibrium. Is there going to be any change in the amount of water movement? Does water movement stop? No. No, but what happens? It's equal in both directions. It's just like with equilibrium in diffusion. Now, with hypo and hypo, a lot of people get these confused, but there's really no reason to. There's really no reason to because what does hypo mean? Excessive. More than, like hyperactive, more activity than normal. Hypo, less than. A hypodermic goes below the dermis. So hyper is more, hypo is less than something you're comparing it to. Okay? So, if you have a cell and you put it into a solution, and the amount of sodium in that solution is the same as the amount of sodium you have inside of that cell in the fluid, that cell is in what kind of solution? That would be an isotonic saline solution, okay? Now, what if we took a cell and we put it into a solution that had less dissolved materials than inside of it? That would be like distilled water, right? Now, how would we describe that solution? Hypotonic, because it has less dissolved material than the thing we are comparing it to. We could also say the cell is hypertonic to the solution. It all depends on what you're referring to. Okay? And then vice versa. If we put a cell into a solution that contains more dissolved material than the cell itself, now the solution is hypertonic, and the cell would be described as hypotonic. Okay, now, here's the problem. People want to define those terms by what happens. Don't. That's just memorizing something. If you remember, where does water want to go? Water wants to go where? Where there's less of it. Where, where there's more, more dissolved stuff, right? So in this situation here, like that, let's just say I'll add a couple more here and a couple here. All right, in this case, there's more dissolved material over here, less over here, so water will go in that direction, right? So in this situation here, which way will the water flow? Into the cell, outside of the cell, or neither? out. The fluid in here will want to dilute out here. So what happens when that occurs? What happens to the cell? It'll shrink. So people go, well, if you put in a hypertonic solution, the cell will shrink. Why? I don't know. <laughs> if you memorize it, that's a problem, right? But if you look at this and say, this has more dissolved material in it, the water in here will want to dilute it, it will shrink. You put a cell in a hypertonic solution and they will shrink. Don't memorize hyper and whatever, just remember what happens. And think your way through it. You'll never be wrong. All right, let's do the reverse then. Let's put a cell into a hypotonic solution. In that case, what's gonna happen? The solution will go into the cell causing the cell to swell. In fact, if it doesn't have a cell wall, that cell will burst. And that's what would happen if you were given an IV of tap water. Well, maybe not our tap water here, we've got some hard water. But if you were given an IV of distilled water, it would literally cause your red blood cells to burst. Hemolysis, it's dangerous, it's lethal actually. So, 
Instead of memorizing what happens when you do something, if you remember what the terms mean, do you have to memorize what happens to the cells? No. What if I told you this? You put a cell into a solution and it got smaller. The cell got smaller. Is the solution hyper, hypo, or iso? If the cell got smaller, it meant it lost fluid because it was trying to dilute. The inside would be more pure, outside would be less pure, the outside would have to be hypertonic. See how that works? You don't have to memorize. Just work your way through it. We know where water goes all the time, right? So if we know the after effects, we know what we started with. Yeah. So these cells have uh, channel proteins to allow the water to go in and out of, out of the protein. Uh, so basically they're diffused. It, they act like they're diffused. Okay. But if the solution is hypo, uh, they get all this inrush of water. They swell and even to the point of bursting, why doesn't the water just go back out of the channel? The reason is um, because the, the, the concentration is never satiated. You never get to a point where the, the outside solution and the inside solution are the same. So even though they've got those channels there, the water still is coming in. So water's uh, <laughs> thirst to equalize is stronger than the cells. Membrane. membrane. The membrane will be disrupted long before you reach equilibrium if you've got a high enough concentration. Now, some you know your cells aren't going to explode. Like if you uh, swim in the ocean, I love this one. How many plan to go to the beach over spring break? No, I don't want to know. Um, all right, you jump in the ocean. The ocean is about nine percent salt water, nine percent sodium chloride. Your cells are 0.9 percent sodium chloride. What's going to happen to your cells? We're going to burst trying to go with the ocean. They won't burst. <laughs> they will dehydrate. What if you jump into a pool full of distilled water? <laughs> your cells will take in that fluid and they will swell. Anyone ever, has that ever happened to anybody? I bet you have. Because we have a bunch of layers in our skin, one of which Stratum granulosum is a waterproof barrier, which means the only cells that this ever bothers are those that are outside of that. And when something gets wet, like paper, what happens to it? It swells. And doesn't it go like this? That's why you get prune fingers. It looks like you're losing fluid, but you're actually gaining it. That's where the pruniness comes from. Because just those little outside cells begin to push against each other, and you have like 30 or 40 layers, which is clearly right here. So they, as they push against each other, they begin to ripple. And you were right. As you're swimming in the ocean, you are trying to dilute the ocean. <laughs> and I guarantee, folks, you'll lose that one. <laughs> um, so, <clears throat> um, have you ever heard the saying, water, water everywhere and not a drop to drink? Mm -hmm. Well, it's a long, it's old, it's old. But anyway. <laughs> The, where this came from is imagine this. Think of me, you're an old seafaring salty dog. You know, 150 years ago, you're on a wooden ship. It's rocking back and forth. These, sh these ships did not travel very quickly. I mean, it took the Mayflower like four months to get from England to the United States, well, to North America, right? Nowadays, it might take a week. It took my dad 12 days to get from New York to Europe when he was heading over. Think about that. If you're talking about months at a time, you run out of stuff to eat, you run out of stuff to drink, and what do you do? You look out and you see water, water everywhere. Wonderful, let's take a big old gulp of it, right? There's a problem. All right. Actually, that's a stomach. Duodenum, jejunum, ilium, colon, 
correct them on all. Okay, so far so good. I never told you I was a good uh, artist. But watch what's happening. This person has been on a sailing ship. He's a pirate. Okay. They're running out of water. He looks out and goes, wow, if I just dumped a bucket overboard and took a big old gulp, wouldn't that settle things? Now remember, he's drying out as we speak, right? He's dehydrating. And what does he do? He takes a big old swig of salt water. Salt water contains more dissolved material than our own fluids. Our blood is approximately 0.9% sodium chloride. The ocean is about 9% sodium chloride. If you go in some tropical areas, it's probably even higher than that. What's going to happen? Is the water in his stomach hypertonic or hypotonic? Hypertonic. When you have a hypertonic solution, what does it do to surrounding water? It attracts it. Where is that fluid coming from? Your Everywhere else. Not only would you start off dehydrated, now what? Now you're even worse. You're, even, you're better off not even touching the stuff if you're dehydrated. That's why the old saying, water, water everywhere, not a drop to drink, because they would be surrounded by the ocean and couldn't drink any of it. Scary, huh? Think about that. Uh, what was the one movie, Open Ocean, where the divers got dumped overboard? Um, was that the one about the, where they're sitting in the middle of the ocean for like a week? There's another story, if you know about the USS Indianapolis, anyone know about that? Yeah. It was sunk during World War II and nobody knew it because they were on a top secret mission. So these guys were in the water, 800 people were in the water for almost a week. And they lose a bunch to sharks. They lost about 500 to sharks or to starvation or de dehydration. Out of the 1,200 on the ship, about 300 were, re were saved. The rest either died of dehydration, never made it off the ship, or were eaten by sharks. Think about that. In the water up to your neck for a week. And nobody knew they were there, so nobody was looking for them. Because it was a top secret mission. It was the single biggest disaster in, in World War II for one ship. Outside of Pearl Harbor. But... Because, I mean, think about that. Up to your necks in, in warm water, and you can't drink any of it. There was actually stories of people going, oh, if you go down just a few feet, it's actually fresh water down there. Guess what? They take their life jackets off, swing down two feet, and what happens? They never came back up again. So, yeah, it was, it was some pretty nasty, nasty conditions. That's why salt water is so tough. That's why survival on the seas is so tough. You have to bring everything with you. Think about this, though. There are animals that live in the ocean, right? Yeah, they, but see what they have is they have a way of getting rid of the extra salt. Every time they open their mouth, they're swallowing salt water. So they have a special mechanism to get rid of. Usually they have like a large gland, like a, their kidneys help get rid of the extra salt. On this diagram over here, uh, the one, yes, that one. Would the water go through active transports of passive? It depends. At this point, it's just passive. Because diffusion and osmosis is purely passive. Okay, even though it is fighting, like if that was in the U kind of shape too. It would, it would be enough to overcome gravity to a point. You could, it wouldn't keep going up, just like you can't, you can't suck water up more than 32 feet. You can pump it up, you can push it up, but you can't suck it up, otherwise it becomes gas. Okay, any question on that? So do I want you to memorize the effects of hyper and hypo? No. All I want you to do is remember remember what it means. To diffuse the rest of the stuff, would your body use active? Uh, okay, we're going to get to that in just a second. So you're a little ahead of the ball game. All right. Uh, one last thing. Have any of you ever seen Apollo 13, the movie? I highly recommend it. I'll tell you right now, they survive. <laughs> It happened in 1972. I think you know by now they survived. But what happens to them is so cool. And it's, it's purely about osmosis and diffusion. More so diffusion than anything else. <clears throat> now, we, this is an example of osmosis and how it affects us directly. And why, if we have fresh water in here, 
How do we get into our system? It literally diffuses through the wall of the intestine into the bloodstream to dilute our blood. In fact, if we have a capillary, and this is something I just covered in ANP2, a capillary is a blood vessel and the blood is traveling in this direction. Now, think of a garden hose. If you puncture a garden hose, what's gonna happen? Water squirts out. That's called hydrostatic pressure. Blood does that. Fluid will leak out of capillaries because of hydrostatic pressure. But what happens? What's left behind means it's getting more concentrated because proteins don't leak out, cells don't leak out. So in fact, this was more dilute. This is more concentrated. So as a, as a fluid becomes more concentrated, we say that it probably compared to the surrounding tissue, how would we describe it? Hypertonic. It's probably hypertonic. It starts out a little bit hypertonic, but becomes even more hypertonic. So by the time we get to this end of the capillary, the surrounding fluid is coming back in to dilute it. We call that oncotic pressure. And the difference between filtration and oncotic pressure is about 15%. Meaning, whatever we lose to filtration, we recover 85% of it to oncotic pressure. What's left over gets picked up by the lymph system, brought back to the bloodstream, and we're good. However, if any of those things fail, if we filter more out, we'll gather more fluid. If we don't recover enough, we'll gather more fluid. If our lymph system doesn't work, we gather more fluid and we end up swelling. So again, something that affects us on a daily basis is osmosis. Getting back to Apollo 13, their problem was not oxygen. At first it was oxygen. They thought they were going to run out of oxygen. Well, they solved that problem. Then they figured out that their spacecraft had too much CO2 in it. So. Watch how this works. This is the lung. It's an alveoli. It's a little air sac in the lung. This is the blood. Okay? Now, because these are so thin, gas can diffuse from one into the other. Just like bubbles coming out of a soda, how it comes out of nothingness, that's because it's dissolved. So what happens is you can have diffusion from a liquid to a, to a gas and vice versa. All right. Now, in this situation, when we inhale, we are going to have a lot of oxygen. What are we going to have a lot in our blood? We're going to have something, but it's not oxygen. CO2. 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 Now, we've got this little thing, it's called the respiratory membrane, cell walls, and cell membranes and so on, but it's called the respiratory membrane. But if there's more oxygen here than here, what's going to happen? It's going to be able to diffuse. If we've got more CO2 here than here, what's going to happen? It's going to diffuse. And that's called gas exchange. This happens in our lungs, and the reverse happens downstream at our tissues. In reverse, where the CO2 diffuses from the tissue into the blood, and the oxygen diffuses from the blood into the tissues. Again, diffusion. In Apollo 13, the problem was the air they were breathing had too much CO2 in it. So, they were starting with CO2 already in the air there. Can you see the problem? The problem is pure diffusion. Is there a concentration gradient? No. The same amount of oxygen in the atmosphere was in, was in their blood. In that situation, you can't get rid of it. Because every time you inhale, you're absorbing as much CO2 as you're giving off. So what happens is the amount of CO2 in their blood would go up, be, their blood becomes acidic, and there's a number of problems that occurs, one of them being dementia. Now, you're flying in a spaceship with no electrical power, no way of steering it, you're 250,000 miles from home, traveling at 17,000 miles an hour, and you're starting to have dementia. Does that sound like a good situation? They actually put stickers up on the wall that said, please don't touch this. So they didn't hit the buttons by accident. That's where they were at. They were able to solve this problem too. And if you've ever seen the movie, it's fabulous. A table full of PhD physicists and mathematicians sticking stuff together with duct tape and plastic wrap. 
It was very cool, and that's exactly how they did it. They were able to fix it, and they made it back. In fact, one of them is still alive. Jim Lovell is still alive, so he was, they were very good at it. Watch it, it's, it's science at its finest. Okay, it's some really cool science involved, and like I said, they all survived, so. Anyway, <laughs> my dad hated movies. I said, we gotta watch it, they all, they survived, okay? It's not, a, it's not sad, it's not a disaster movie, it's actually a, a good story. So anyway, diffusion, osmosis, and this is just tip of the iceberg. This is just one example of how diffusion and, osmo and osmosis affects us on a, health, on a daily basis. Right now, you're diffusing uh, O2 into your tissues and taking CO2 out of them. It's constant. The funny thing is, when I teach a &P, I'll start over here, the lungs will be over here, and the tissues will be over there, and I'll cover the entire board with, with the, uh, the process of how it works. I say, please make sure you write this down because I don't want to do it again. And it just it's, the whole thing is covered up. So it's a, it's a pretty complex process, but that's it in a nutshell right there. Okay? So, a couple more things. With cells, as I said, you don't have to memorize the effects because if you know what hyper and hypotonic mean, you know exactly what's going to happen. So again, I could ask you, you put a cell into a solution, that cell swells. Defi describe the solution. If the cell swells, what is the solution? That means that the fluid went into the cell, and when do you get fluid going into the cell when the solution is hypo? The cell would be hyper, hypotonic, all right? So there's different ways you can look at that. What if you put a cell into a solution and nothing happens? Isotonic. Isotonic. Now, <clears throat> remember, this has a different effect on animals and plants because animals do not have a cell wall. Plants do. So for instance, if you put a, an animal cell into an isotonic solution, the inward flow of water and the outward, or the influx and efflux, are the same. That cell will be just fine. If you put a cell into a hypotonic solution, now once again, don't memorize the effect, just remember what hypotonic means, less dissolved material. That water is going to want to dilute the cell, cell swells, and could burst because cell membranes are weak. You put a cell into a hypertonic solution, the solution has a higher concentration than the cell, the cell will want to dilute it, and the cell will shrink. We will actually show a video in lab showing the blood cells doing that. They actually will, will shrink. <clears throat> uh, we actually we, we do a thing with, with uh, celery, but celery is a plant. Now, because plants have a cell wall, they're much more stable. They're much more sturdy. Under most normal conditions, the solution that plants have in their tissues is higher than their cells. So they are, or, uh, sorry, reverse. The fluid they have in their, in their vessels and things is usually hypotonic, which means we call it turgid. Kind of like a, like a tire has extra air in it. There's more air inside the tire than the surrounding atmosphere. That's the way it is with plants. Plants have more fluid inside of them norm, than surrounding their surrounding vessels. That's why plants are solid, they're stiff. We call it turgid. The amount of water inside of plant cells is their turgor pressure. And that's because equilibrium is never reached. The fluid in their vessels is always trying to dilute the cells. And because they never get to equilibrium, it's a constant. On the other hand, if you would put cell, a plant into salt water and that cell cannot handle it, it will shrink. And then they get real rubbery. We do that in class, we do it. Take a piece of celery and, and soak it overnight in salt water. And the next day, it's actually you can bend it because it's lost so much fluid that the cells become almost rubbery. So, under normal circumstances, the, a hypotonic solution is normal. So, if you take a plant and you put it into a hypertonic solution, you end up with what's called plasmolysis because the cell walls can't shrink. The cytoplasm inside will actually will actually shrink. Now. In that case, because of the shape of the cell, equilibrium is rarely ever reached either. 
So again, under normal circumstances, plants will take in fluid that is hypotonic, which case it will try to dilute their own cells and keep the cells stiff. Because, well, because the cells have that cell wall, they can't keep getting bigger. And once you get to a certain point where you can't take in any more, oh. it stops. It's not that it doesn't want to take in any more, it just physically can't get any bigger. Like, like our blood cells will keep going until they burst. And since the, the cell wall keeps it from bursting, you can only fit so much in. Okay, any questions? All right, we've got one more day. We're gonna talk about the other parts of, of uh, things like phagocytosis uh, and cannabidosis and so on. Do me a favor, bring, <coughs> bring questions with you on Wednesday. Whatever we don't cover, I mean, as far as we have extra time, bring questions with you. Thank you right now. Oh, sorry. Did you decide about um, mastering biology? Moving it. Okay. Yep. I'll move it to Thursday night. Okay. Thank you.